Good morning. I am Tavon uh, Mitchell. I serve as a... Wow. Well, you guys are... Wow. You guys are cool. Uh, I serve over as pastor at Gospel Life Church, Kill Stream, and so uh, some people call me Pastor John because they say I look and sound like John Legend. Some call me... <laughs> Some call me Pastor Denzel, which is a great compliment, and, uh, but you can call me Tay uh, on today, and I'm glad you are here or watching online, worshiping with us today in God's, in God's place. And so uh, allow me quickly, over the last several months, uh, you all, many of you, if not all of you, have kept my family and I in prayer, and from the bottom of our hearts, from the bottom of my hearts, we thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, the journey of suffering uh, is never easy, and we can sometimes ask the questions, Lord, why, where are you? Take this away. But he meets us right there in the middle, and we have not, uh, we wouldn't have got through this last seven and a half months since the cancer diagnosis of Sam uh, without the prayers and support of your people. And so uh, thank you for loving on us well, and uh, I pray uh, that we continue to see healing through this. We got one report uh, after seven months that the uh, legions on the liver are starting to shrink just a little bit. They lift nodes. Come on, we can celebrate that. That is absolutely good news. And so our main concern now is there in the bones that we will see some healing, uh, healing there. And so uh, I'm excited to preach with you and be here today and worship with you. If you have not uh, heard me preach before, I say this, I'm like a teen driver, right? I'm going to go to speed limit a little bit, and then I'm going to break the speed limit, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to give you a little this and that. But uh, it's going to be good as we proclaim God's word. And so meet me in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is where uh, we are going to be. And over the last several weeks or months, we already spent some time dissecting this book that led us to where we are today. And this is where Paul has strongly labored over the last uh, times we've preached this upon several things. Our justification, election, where we stand in Christ, and it is not by our best efforts or by our works, but he clearly makes the point, it is only because and by the grace of God for those who put their faith and trust in Christ. And then he says, someday, later, we'll see this kind of image of glorification where where all, all our lives that are wrapped in his, he would then come back and glorify us and give us new bodies. But until that happens, here's the word uh, we've been talking about. It's a sanctification process that's going on. This ongoing being sharpened and chiseled into his image. And last week, our pastors shared how we ought to think rightly, which is allows transformation in our lives to begin to exude out. And what Paul does in this section that we are preaching, he He does this by exhorting the Roman Christians to present their bodies as living sacrifices, meaning to be alive, to be holy, to be set apart, and to be pleasing to God. And friends, not just to the Roman Christians, but to you and I today, sitting in this room or watching online, that same exhortation is to us, that we live as a sacrifice for him. But Paul made it very clear. We only do this if we uh, renew the way we think, a renewing of our minds so that we are not conformed to the world, but transformed into the very calling and image God has for us. And today, Paul really shares out some details or kind of give his first illustration of how we do that in the next couple of verses, Romans 3 through 8. And so... Let's jump into the passage, and it says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Verse 4, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, Our one body, watch this language he uses back and forth as he has done in Romans, in Christ. And individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If if, if prophecy in the proportion of your faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, 
the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. He says, as we renew our mind, we now get a chance to showcase this in how we use our gifts. And what Paul does from the onset, which he is a friend of mine because he takes us back to what has given us gifts in the first place. He says, let me give you this charge because of the grace that's been given to me. Now, at this point, yes, Paul is highlighting a little bit of his uh, saving faith, but also the fact that Paul has authority to be an apostle. You, You know some of Paul's story, the persecutor of the church, set in high positions and didn't care what was going on until he had this experience on the road to Damascus. Paul says, hey, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I should not be in any position of serving apostleship or leadership. And then he says, not only is that true of me, but friends, it's true of you. Can you recall your life? The moment before you said yes to Jesus? The moment before he came in and he changed our heart of stone to a heart of flesh, where he called us from being a sinner to now a saint, where he made us new in him. Because, friends, here's the truth. Every single one of us deserve punishment. Every single one of us deserve hell. But thanks be to God, he did not give us what we deserve, but what he did give us was in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And at that moment, what Christ had done for us, he then extended grace upon us. Grace is this God's unmerited favor for us and to us. And it is something that is not to be earned like a trophy, but what he does is he gives it freely for those who believe. And he sets this passage off right, or these next couple of verses off right, that we only can think of this way because of the grace of God. Can I share a little bit of the grace of God? Here it is in, in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. It says this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. He says this, it is by grace that you have been saved. Or how about Titus 2, 11 through 12? For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to the ungodliness and the worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Is there another one? Yes. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. Dear friends, it is from the gift of God, not by works so that any man may boast. Paul sets this off right. He says the first thing we have to do now, these next couple of verses, is to have a proper thinking of yourself. To have a proper thinking of yourself, it is by the grace of God that I even stand here today to declare God's word. It changes us. It gives us new holy habits. It grows us into the very image that God has caused to do. And Paul sets that off from the onset. So he says, number one, you got to have a proper thinking of self. Paul at this moment, he really serves as a big piece of humble pie. A really big piece of humble pie. That on our best day, in our best efforts, when we thought we clean ourselves up and come to God, it is, that's not even good enough. It is as we live in this grace and this faith of him, Paul's saying is from the get-go, we were jacked up, broken, sin-filled, full of sin, broken, shame, and guilt. But God had a solution through Jesus Christ to satisfy the complete wrath of God, and he gave his life for ours. And so you, dear people, hear me. You have grace. We live under such a beautiful grace. As the old hymn pins the song, matter of fact, it's not just good grace, it's kind of amazing grace that would save us. And so, with that said, Paul says, now, let's make sure our facts are in order, and then we can carry on. He says, because the way believers of God's family should think of themselves, look here at verse, into verse 3, not to think of your themselves more highly than they ought. He says, the way believers should think of themselves is not highly, and later on is actually also not lowly. 
But the way we think of ourselves is with humility. Not with pride, not with arrogance, not with self-centeredness, but with humility. Now, I, uh, last week, I got a chance to spend several, well, let me be honest, waste several honor, uh, hours watching the Masters. I watch the Masters every April. It's good. I enjoy golf. And every time I watch the Masters, here's what happens. I get to the clubhouse, and I am the man. I watch these guys swim, swing. I watch them guys hit holes and birdies and pars and have good scores. And so I get to the clubhouse and I am the man. I started looking for new clubs last week. <laughs> Almost pulled the trigger on that $899 pair. <laughs> the new fit is ready. And I walk in there, there it is, the master's hat, and I walk in there ready. This is the point where I get to the clubhouse and I'm like, mm, there's no better golfer out here than me. None. I, I should be on PGA Tour. And I walk in, get my hat, my sweater, I'm like Tiger Hood, not Tiger Wood. Like, I'm like Tiger Wood, and it's time to golf. At, at this point, when I think about this, friends, we can't have a clubhouse mentality in the body of Christ. We can't walk into God's body as his people and think my thinking that I do when I get on a golf course after watching hours of the masters. Paul says, actually, we can't do that because we cannot think of ourselves more highly than we ought. We are only able to stand, and he goes back again, or better yet, we are only able to breathe and live and move and have our being simply because of God's grace. As the kids say, periods, boo. That is it, because of God's grace. And what happens is sometimes in the body, at this time, remember what Paul is writing to. He's writing to the Roman Christians in Rome. Now, Rome wasn't known <laughs> for a culture or people to have humility. Rome, who would conquer dynasties and families and people over and over again, and now you get Paul sharing this message in Rome to the Roman Christians and say, don't look like what the culture is doing, back to 12, 1 and 2, conform to the world. You got to walk with some humility. And, and what happens is, as I do on that golf course, this comparison sets in. And this is what we can't have in the body. Uh, 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 Nelson Illustrated Commentary puts it this way. It'll be on the screen. He says, what happens is sometimes we get comparisonitis. It's not a medical term you would find in the dictionary, but comparison-itis is the tendency to measure one's worth by comparing oneself to another. Comparison-itis happens when people find ways to look down on others and think highly of themselves because they enjoy greater abilities, intelligence, status, or wealth than they. Paul is saying if we have a renewed way of thinking and living, comparison-itis cannot be a diagnosis of the Christian. Because we all are equal at the cross, all sinners who are blood washed by one blood, whether you're here in Carol Stream or Accra, Ghana or Brazil, all who proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior are equal at the cross. We can't live, we can't have comparison itis. And what happens is, friends, this absolutely breaks the heart of God when we get this wrong. When we get this clubhouse mentality in the body, it absolutely breaks the heart of God, and our witness is tainted as God's people. It destroys unity in the body. The Message Bible says this. I love this. Uh, in verse 3, he says, I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves, watch this, as people who bring the goodness to God. No, it is God who brings the goodness or grace to us. And the only true way to understand ourselves is by what God is and what God has done for us, not by who we are or what we have done for him. On the onset, he said the renewal way of thinking is not to think of ourselves more highly. 
And so, friends, do you know what is more Christ-like than anything else? Than anything else? Here's the thing with me. I preach faster if you talk back. If not, I'm going to preach a little slow. <laughs> you, you know what's Christ-like more than anything else? Humility. Humility. Did not Jesus, the son of the eternal God who created everything, step out of uh, heaven to come down into earth and put on human flesh? And the text says in Philippians that he considered himself not even equal with God, that he will come to us. And he humbled himself to death. Yes, death on a cross. This death on a cross was for criminals, those who broke the law. Jesus was absolutely perfect. He humbled himself to even death on a cross. You know what's like more than anything else? If we take a little slither of that DNA of humility of Jesus, and it becomes a part of who we are. Not more highly or thinking highly than we ought. And so then Paul says, well, at this point, if you get that in mind, you're going to have sober judgment. Sober judgment that you're going to realize, hey, I stand lost and a sinner saved by grace just as my other brothers and sisters sisters and do. And what happens at that point, now we use our gifts according to the measure of faith because here it is, our gifts are not for boasting, but to be used because of the grace and faith God has given us. I can spend 45 minutes just here on verse 3. At this point, he talks about this measure or faith, or a better word to say that is this standard of faith. This is not just a quantity of faith or faith levels, because I just don't believe God would say, well, here, you're level 10 and someone else is level 1. Now, there is maturity and growing in him. This is uh, saving faith, but this is also the standard of faith. At this point here, when he says measure of faith, it's more uh, subjective than it is objective. This is what it looks like when the Christian exercise their faith. And the point is not that God has given every Christian different levels of faith or degrees of faith, but that God has given every Christian the same standard of faith. And at that moment, everyone who realizes that shares the same grace that has been poured out among us, and we use our gifts in faith. John Stott says the best this way, if God's gospel is the first measure by which we evaluate ourselves, then second is God's gifts to us, which is so true. Every believer receives gifts and supernatural resources to fulfill his or her role in the body of Christ. And so if you walk away with nothing else from this message today, here's what I want you to walk away with. Your gifts, or make it personal, my gifts represent what God has made you to do, so use them. After we get it right of thinking, it says, now use these gifts in the right manner. Look at the continuation of verse 4. For as many members are one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. You realize that once you and I become a part of the body or a part of Christ, you don't become a part of Christ as an individual, or better, way, better yet to say it, as an individual only, right? I, I can't believe for you. I can't work your own salvation for you. But, but we join in this corporate community, and when we become a part of Christ, you now have been adopted into this family that we now participate in his church. Yes, the building, but also his church, his people, capital C, low case C. We, we now participate in church. So first he says, now you have to have the proper thinking of yourself. But then he says, you have to have the proper thinking of others. And that's where our gift comes in. If you look back at this, he says, we are members in one body. There are only two places in the New Testament where these lists of categories or spiritual gifts are given here and in, and in 1 Corinthians 12. Not for the sake that you go through and you check these off like, ah, I'm good here, and yep, I got this one, and ooh, I just put this one on this morning, blush. <laughs> no. That, that we work within our gifts. We don't check them off like a bingo card, but it is to show us that we have been faithfully called to embody the grace and to use our gifts he has given us. And when he does that, you know what God does? He goes to work. Because he blends it together like colors on a painting, and it becomes so beautiful for his 
body. Perfect example of this. This last Monday on my day off, you're going to get a little personal in Pastor's Tay life. One of the things I enjoy to do monthly is to get a pedicure. Come on. <laughs> yes. We did it in Africa, Jackie and Bree. A crock got him. My month was up. Let me go get this petty. So I walk in, as I normally do, and say, hey, and what are you getting? I just want the classic. I know, you know, $33, that's what I'm spending. So the girl comes up, and she looks at my nails. She's like, what about your nails? What about Maddie? She's trying to upsell me. And I'm like, no, 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 I normally just do the feet, feet only. And she, like, looks at my cuticle, and she's like, ew, how can you do that? And so she sold me, friends. (laughs) $33 turns into $73. 85 with tip, all right? Hopefully I tipped right. And as I'm sitting there, this, this illustration came clear. The woman in front of me, she's getting, I mean, lit nails are long. And they, pu- they, they pull out this, like, queue of colors. And it is pages. And she is flipping through these pages. She's like, I just want the nails that are, like, most natural to my skin color. And the technician's like, how about this one? It's like 95 different colors that she has in front of her. And by the time my feet is done, she is almost done, but the color is going on her nails. And when I think about the different gifts, I think about those, 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 those folds of colors. Each has a purpose. And at some point, they're going to be showcased on her hand that this nail shop gets the recognition for. When it comes to the body, all of our gifts are like these blended colors that the Lord puts together, and then he gets the recognition and praise for a matter of fact, he says, it's like the human body. He gives this analogy of the body. And Paul point at this point is very good one for those who are not haughty, for those who are not prideful, for those who are not despondent. You are both part of the same body. And if you're part of the same body, we can't tell another, same, another part of the body you don't matter or you're nothing or you're useless. What Paul drives here is the diversity and the unity of the church is compared to the human body. And here what Paul wants us to get in our mind today in this corporate sense of things, that is, for those of us who think you don't need someone else because maybe we want to be in charge, or we want to be in control, Paul says, no, 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 you got it wrong. What you need is the rest of the body because there's many members in one body who do not have the same function. But he talks about we are in Christ. This is the point where you feel like, you know what? I got to church and I just kind of don't feel like I belong. Friends, you belong in the body. Can I go back to why? Because grace has been poured out and lavished upon you. And God then takes your natural gifts and your spiritual gifts and you use them for his body. Friend, you belong in the body. Use your gifts and your passions just how he calls us to. Because what happens, he's looking here at uh, into verse 5, middle verse 5. So we, though, who are many members, he talks about this body over and over again, like these color schemes, are one body in Christ. (laughs) Not in brand, not in position, not in social economic status, not in self, but in Christ, the church, is a unified body under the headship of Christ, and the members have different gifts. Tay, what do you mean? I'm glad you asked. He says this, you have union with Christ. And when we have a union with Christ, everything pertaining to salvation, to us as believers, flows out of our union with Christ, that he has made us new, that he has given us a new status to God because we are in Christ. Charles Spurgeon says this, there is no joy in this world like the union we have with Christ. We've been counted sons and daughters. Friends of God? Not We can pay into this. We can look good for this. It's because of what Christ has done for us. He has now united us into this body. And the more we feel that, the more I believe our joy is complete. When we walk in here, when we see the different gifts that are being used every day, every Sunday, 
throughout the week, our office staff and our pastoral team and our church staff, where they're using their gifts every day. That should make our joy complete that our brothers and sisters are using their gifts to serve the body, the community, and the world. At this point, our union with Christ is the center of our salvation and our sanctification, and it is central to all our deepest joys in life. Friends, it's not just the meaning, it's a reality. We've been united with Jesus. We have been united with Jesus because of the work he has done on the cross. And so what, you sh- what should you be doing? Paul makes it very clear here. He says what you should be doing, well, not the only thing, of course, you should be doing, but the main thing you should be doing is getting involved in the body, submitting to a local community, a church, and using your gifts. Many members in one body, we are individually to another. And then he says here in verse 6, we're going to have gifts that are different from another. Because this is the way he has made you. This is the way he has set you up. This is the way he's created you. This is the way you thrive in him. May of 2021, I sat in the office of a corporate world job. I spent five and a half years in finance. And I had a stern in my heart. I was in ministry, out of college. I ran from it because I was wounded after serving three years because sheep bite and it hurts. And I ran. And I got into finance. And the Lord opened doors like no other. By 28, I had a title as an officer at a bank. And I said, Lord, I'm going to ride this pony until I can't no more. This is good. And then I realized as coming to church and hearing the word and prayer and others speaking into my life, I kind of masked this gift God's given me in shepherding, maybe in preaching. And so I said in my office on my birthday, April 30th, May of 2021, and I sent the email. So the CEO, who was my direct report, who I reported directly to, and then our, our manager, resignation, done. I give you 30 more days, and I'm out. So you know, in any business, they're like, you know, we kind of don't want your 30 days. Here's your severance. Get to moving. <laughs> I left April 30th, May 21. I had a baby the next day, May 1st. We're still working out what does that look like if I come back to full-time ministry here. How does that work? I was in student ministry at the time. My daughter was born. I didn't get that role until step into this interim role until about May 8th, May 10th of 2021. Did you know what I had? I had this stirring in my heart that my highest and best use was no longer putting on a suit and tie and having lending conversations and open up checkings and savings and money markets and and telling people where to put money in mutual funds, or do you do this, yada, yada, yada. You know what my best use was? <laughs> Help training God's people and communicating the goodness of God through preach word. And the Lord has absolutely honored that. I have felt the most fulfilled in my life ever. You know why? Because I realized that God calls us to commit to a local body, using our gifts, and seeing the world as he sees it. And then he says this, there's some gifts, and I won't go through all of them, but he says prophecy. Now, you got to be careful with this prophecy thing, because some may have the gift of prophecy, but also some may have the gift of prophet lion. (laughs) (laughs) There's two senses of what happens here in prophecy. There is foretelling, meaning this prediction, which I believe is ceased in the first century, or foretelling where you proclaim God's word, you are a herald of him, where you are sharing what the Lord has said, where you are preaching the preached word of God. Or else what the text says, for you have the gift of service or ministry, as some translations say. This is, this is the sense that you carry the load of ministry for others. You love it. This is where you get the word deacon or deaconess from, is that you help carry the load of ministry or teaching, the ability to interpret or clarify or systematize and explain God's truth more clearly or exhortation, lifting one's spirit or encouragement or comfort or giving 
Maybe you are at the point where you are absolutely maxed. You have zero margin. But what the Lord has given you is funds that we all are called to give as a believer, as a step of faith. But maybe there's some who have a lot of extra and can fund a mission trip to et cetera, et cetera, give to a school, yada, yada. He said, you have that gift, then work with that gift. You have the gift of leadership where you can influence others and lead them and, and put them in their gifts, do it. And then he says, you have the gift of mercy and care where you are called to give aid to people who are in distress. You're keeping your eyes open. Here's what I'm saying. You may look at this list, this small list, and intuitively, intuitively say, you know what? I kind of recognize some of those gifts. But the question I beg to you is, are you using them? Friends, you got to help me out with this illustration, because if it doesn't, it goes flat, and we all look awkward. In, in growth track, this is kind of our three-week on-ramp, it's the new body of our church. We give these kind of spiritual gifts and parents. How, how about this? If you have any of these gifts that I'm going to share, just simply raise your hand, and I want you to leave it up. How about anybody in the room, gift of administration? You can organize multiple tasks, group, people. No, oh, we got some hands there. Okay, accomplish these tasks. How about craftsmanship? You can build things. You can plan. You can work with your hands. You got constructions. You can do uh, environments. How about discernment? This gift where you spiritually know, like, this is the right way to go. You can discern what is right or wrong. How about evangelism? To help non-Christians or take necessary steps to people becoming born again. How about exhortation? The ability to, to comfort others and urge. The list goes on. How about helps? You're supportive in helping people and bringing uh, uh, needs to them. Hospitality. You can create this warm and welcoming environment over and over again. Intercession. You're praying for others. Think about that list. And as I was saying, that hands were going up. Friends, this is what Paul is talking about when he says we are in the body of Christ, and we ought to use our gifts because here it is. Here's our tagline of this whole sermon, and I'm in my seat. Is this that the gospel rewrites grace into every relationship we have? And that is us using what God has given us, our spiritual gifts to be birth for his glory. You discover those gifts by prayer, by Bible study, but you also know that the best one why don't you find somebody you know, pastor, peer, elder, and ask them this, this question. Hey, hey, what do you think I'm good at? Hey, what do you see God is doing in my life? And we use those gifts for him. So, so what does our, our spiritual gifts require of us? Number one is this. I call it spiritual centeredness. Spiritual centeredness. It means this, it's all from God and it all advances his kingdom. Whether you can move a mop the best, whether you can open the door the best, whether you can preach or teach or serve, it's a spiritual centeredness because of the grace that's been given to you. It requires us to have this. It is not about ourselves. It is about him. Number two, a spiritual consciousness. Here's what I mean by that is, Lord, am I really hearing from you? Am I in tune through your word and prayer and through the affirmation of others? I hear from God and I answer with obedience. Because you know what he does on the other side of our step of obedience? He likes the path before us and he answers and he opens up doors. Number four, it's a personal selflessness personal selflessness meaning this we all have been given grace we don't deserve and the church says nah we all been given grace that we don't deserve and the church says yep yeah. yeah. so let's willingly serve another Jesus who would come down and put on human flesh did that for us so we selflessly serve if we all took a service once a month in some capacity in God's kingdom, oh, how great it would be for all of our other volunteers, but also for you. It's a personal selflessness. Number four, here's a hard one. Whatever gifts you have and whatever gifts you don't have, you know what's in the middle of that? Contentment. Our gifts require that you are content, that we will celebrate what others have. I can sing a little bit. But I cannot be a worship pastor. I can't read music. I don't know how to work those ear thingies. <laughs> C 
contentment. I got to be cool with that. I got to be cool with a person who can knock out a spreadsheet in 40 minutes. It takes me a whole 365-day Microsoft class. We got to leave the contentment. Then the last one. You know what our gifts require? A powerful witness. Is I want to look like Jesus so Jesus is known to all. You know what happens when people come into a church building on Sunday morning? Some come broken. Some come doubt, doubtful. Some come hopeless. Some come lost. Some come very wounded. And what happens is when we all use our gifts as a body, it is a powerful witness that Jesus has called us to a great work and no devil in hell, no scheme of man will ever discard or do that from God because our witness is to make him known. Our witness is to change the world by the love of Jesus Christ that's been lavished upon us. And so, friends, let's use our gifts that's been given to us through grace for the edification and the sanctification of his people. Let's pray together. Lord, it is so good to be reminded of the calling you've given us, the gifts you've given us, not for ourselves, but to grow, but to declare that Jesus is alive. And he calls sinners and saints to himself. And so, Lord, in the room today, if there's a stirring of the heart, may the answer be yes. May it be obedience. May it be faith. Thank you for those who use their gifts already. We look forward to the day where all of God's children are one body, where the hand's not saying to the foot, I don't need you. The eyeball is saying to the head, we don't need you. No, we all work together to serve your name. Thank you for a place. Thank you for freely being able to express those gifts in worship. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.